Well, we've just galloped through a thousand years of European Christian art and architecture in six days, and now I am going to commit an even greater educational crime and jet through 3,500 years of Chinese art in two days. Three, if you count our day on Chinese Buddhist art back in an earlier unit. I hope you can forgive me. I'm not sure I can forgive myself. The Jade Kong was our first Chinese work. This is a Neolithic work without a written history, and there's a very lively debate among art historians about what the Kong and the face on it actually mean. The College Board seems to have come down on the side of the argument that its square shape represents the earth, just as round bi disks represent the sky, and that the face has some kind of shamanistic association. These conclusions are based on similarities to later Chinese works that may or may not carry the same meaning. These are no longer required works, but they represent an important evolution in Chinese art. The Bronze Age Chinese believed the king's right to rule was based on his good relations with the spirits of his ancestors and the great forces of nature, the sun and rain gods who controlled the outcome of the harvest. To win their favor, the king made regular sacrifices of wine and cereals, which were placed in these elaborate bronze vessels and heated over the fires of a temple altar. The Shang Dynasty is the first historic Chinese dynasty, that is, the first one for which we have written records. I'm not including any art from the successor Zhou Dynasty, none are required works. But note that this is the dynasty that seems to have introduced the concept of the Mandate of Heaven, basically to justify overthrowing the Shang rulers. You watch the homework video and know all about the Mandate of Heaven, right? The Zhou Dynasty gradually dissolved into several competing kingdoms who, as the name Warring States period suggests, spent a lot of time fighting each other. This relatively short period is actually very important to intellectual and to art history, not so much because of the art it produced, but because this turmoil helped give rise to three very important philosophical schools that continue to be represented in Chinese art really up to this day. Confucius was a minor government official who was deeply disturbed by the chaos that was overwhelming China. He developed a philosophy that focused on creating and preserving social order, mostly through right relationships. These relationships were hierarchical, with the most important being father-son. The emperor was seen as a father to the entire country. Another Chinese religious tradition that developed during this period was Taoism. It, too, focused on harmony, but in this case, a harmony created by an equilibrium of opposites, yin and yang, representing these familiar symbols, represented by these familiar symbols. Yang is the force of creation, and yin is the force of completion and degeneration. Yang is male, yin is female. Taoism also focuses on unity with nature in a way that puts a person into harmony with the environment. To talk about the third philosophy, legalism, I'm going to turn to China's first emperor and our first college board required work for this unit. China was reunited in 221 BCE under King Cheng, who later renamed himself Shi Huangdi, or first emperor. Emperor Qin and his associates followed a harsh philosophy or school of law known as legalism, which had grown out of the turmoil of the Warring States period. It called for unquestioned devotion to the emperor. Eventually, this stern governing philosophy and a very powerful, well-led army broke the power of the regional feuding factions and unified China. Basically, legalists thought Confucians were a bunch of softies and Taoists were a bunch of tree huggers. Qin famously ordered most existing books to be burned and more than 400 Confucian scholars to be buried alive. But to give Emperor Qin credit, he was also an extraordinarily effective leader. He unified China and expanded its borders significantly. He built the first version of the Great Wall. He established a uniform set of language characters, currency, and weights and measures. He created efficient central and regional bureaucracies, and he built a powerful army manned by soldiers from all over China. Remember the Chinese belief that ancestors became spirits who could wreak good or evil on their descendants, depending in part on how diligently those descendants kept feeding the ancestors food and drink or otherwise propitiating their spirits. 
Chinese historians report that Qin also was obsessed with his own immortality, but apparently, and for good reason, he was not especially confident that future generations were going to take good care of him. He set out to solve this problem the way he'd solved all his other problems, with a powerful army loyal to the emperor. The discovery of Emperor Qin's terracotta army is one of the most amazing stories in the history of archaeology, and I don't have time to tell it now, alas. Amazingly, archaeologists still have not opened his main tomb. The terracotta figures are life-size. They vary in height, uniform, and hairstyle in accordance with rank. Most originally held real weapons, such as spears, swords, or crossbows. In fact, these weapons have become a hugely important source of information for military historians. The figures were also originally painted with bright pigments. Artisans turned out these figures almost like cars on an assembly line. Clay, unlike bronze, lends itself to quick and cheap fabrication. Workers built bodies, then customized them with heads, hats, shoes, mustaches, ears, and so on, all made in small molds. They appear to have representative features of people from different regions of China, emphasizing again the emperor's role as China's unifier. Recent digs have revealed that in addition to the clay soldiers, Emperor Xi's underground realm included terracotta officials and even troops of acrobats, slightly smaller than the soldiers, but created with the same methods. He also had a lot of company in his tomb. Any concubine who hadn't borne the emperor a son had the dubious honor of being strangled and buried with the emperor. The workmen who built the tomb were also closed in as soon as it was completed and left to die. Altogether, a charming fellow. The brutal but effective Qin Dynasty was succeeded by the Han Dynasty, which ruled China for a period roughly comparable to that of the Roman Empire. This was one of China's golden ages, a time of economic prosperity, scientific advance, and at least at first, political unity and pretty good governance. It was also an era of great art. Han works fill art museums all over the world. I've included a few examples here, none of which is a required work. Instead, we're going to examine just one Han Dynasty work, but it's an artifact that captures the cosmology of the Han. Before I get to Lady Di's funeral banner, however, let me talk a little about what historians call the Han Synthesis. Basically, Han rulers combined the three philosophies I outlined earlier, Confucianism, Taoism, and Legalism. Han rulers revered books and learning, no more burning books or burying scholars alive. But the Han rulers did adopt the Qin belief in an absolute central government. They just tried to reinforce it with philosophy and education as well as brute force. Taoism contributed to the Han belief that the universe is run by a single force, the Tao, or great ultimate. This principle, again, is divided into two opposite principles, yin and yang. From Confucianism, Han thinkers, emperors, adopted the notion of hierarchy with the emperor very much on top, but the responsibilities were mutual. The emperor was responsible for enacting economic policies that promoted prosperity and for ruling by example as a strict but benevolent father. We just looked at one of China's big archaeological finds from the last century, the terracotta tomb. The tombs at Muangdui in Hunan province were another. The three coffins you see on the right held a Chinese nobleman, his wife, and probably their son. The Lady of Dai was buried with a large collection of luxury goods intended to sustain her in the afterlife. By the way, her body was so well preserved, the doctor, doctors were able to perform an autopsy. She died of a heart attack, probably caused by a diet too rich in sugar and fat. This painted silk banner was draped over her coffin. Earlier, it had probably been carried in front of her funeral procession to represent her name in the afterlife. Some art historians think it may have been intended to bring her back to life. A more likely theory is that the banner was intended to attract the spirit of the deceased to its tomb, where it could probably be started on its afterlife journey, instead of remaining on earth to bother the living. Like immortality, troublesome ancestors were serious business in China. The banner describes Lady Di's journey to heaven. It is decorated with spirits, legends, and symbols of immortality associated with the Queen Mother of the West. The banner's design is divided vertically into yin on the left, mixture in the center, and yang on the right, and horizontally into the three realms of heaven, earth, and the underworld. 
So let's start with the upper or heavenly realm. On the left side, the yin or female side, we see a toad above and a rabbit next to a crescent moon. According to legend, a woman named Chang selfishly gulped down an elixir of immortality that her husband had won from the Queen of the West. The rabbit made this elixir. She decided to take it all for herself. Although she did gain her immortality, she began to float up toward the moon and was transformed into a toad. On the right side, the yang or masculine side, we see a sun with a raven. According to legend, ten suns lived in a tree. Each morning, one of the suns, that sun with a U, took a turn shining in the sky, leaving the others resting in the tree. But one day, bored with their orderly life, they all rushed up into the sky at once and ran around wildly having fun and, in the process, scorching the earth. The legendary archer Hu Yi became so angry at the sight that uh, at the sight of dead and dying burned people on earth that he shot nine of the ten suns. He had to be reminded to leave one sun in the sky. So experts argue over these interpretations and I certainly don't know enough to take sides. But let me ask more generally, what did these images suggest about Chinese beliefs? Well to me it seems pretty clear that this design reflects at least some belief in an ordered heavenly realm a natural division between female and male roles, and a strong preference for everybody following the rules to maintain order. The central part of the banner shows Lady Di in her earthly roles. She leans on a cane while two persons crouch or kneel in front of her, and three women, presumably attendants, stand behind her. Remember our woman in the catacomb of Priscilla portrayed at different moments in her life? And here we see family, the family offering sacrifices and prayers for the safe ascent of Lady Di's soul to heaven. Note that the ritual vessels for offering food and drink to the ancestors look a lot like the bronzes we saw earlier in this lecture. Khan Academy, for some reason, didn't include an image from the underworld. But here we see a powerful male figure supporting the lower platform, bracing his feet against the backs of two intertwined fish. The figure may be a water deity who generates yin and yang and therefore ensures that the seasons progress, crops grow, and more babies are born. Note that two dragons run along the edge of the lower section, helping to unify the space. Their bodies pass through the hole of a bi disc, which again traditionally represents the sky or heavenly realms, just as square Kong represents the earth. So, does anyone know what dragons signify in Chinese tradition? Well, in Chinese tradition, unlike, say, Christian traditions such as St. George and the Dragon, dragons are mostly good guys. They bring masculine energy or yang to the universe. They bring rain, but they also bring floods and earthquakes. In other words, they represent power, and the Han emperors, eager to win and keep power, adopted the dragon as their symbol. So here we have a belief in an afterlife, depiction of family piety and order, the contrast of yin and yang, a shout out to the emperor, the Han synthesis immortalized on a piece of silk. The Han dynasty also saw a major expansion in China's interaction with people outside its borders. The famous Silk Road opened under Han rule. It skirted, indeed it was sheltered by the Great Wall. It connected China to Constantinople and from there to Rome. The Silk Road also encouraged travel and Chinese society became increasingly cosmopolitan. Eventually, heavy tax burdens from the centralized bureaucracy, the concentration of land in the hands of a few wealthy aristocrats, and disunity at court brought down the Han Dynasty. For the next 300 years, China was once again ruled by warring states. Eventually, in 618, the Tang Dynasty succeeded in reuniting China and would rule until 908. We've actually already talked about the Sui and Tang Dynasties. What big development from this period shows up in our course? These were the years when Buddhism came to China, a Mahayana Buddhism that emphasized communal salvation, a hierarchical order including multiple Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and communion with nature, all themes associated with the Chinese. The Sui and Tang leaders also used Buddhism to bolster their political power. Remember China's one empress, Wu Zetian? She was the great patron of this complex, the Longmen Caves. I'm going to stop here and finish up my whirlwind tour of Chinese art in my next two lectures.